production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The challenges and opportunities of higher education in Memphis, tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Marjorie Haas, President, Rhodes College. Thanks for being here again. My pleasure, it's wonderful to see you. And Jack Shannon is the new president of CBU, Christian Brothers University. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Along with Bill Drees, reporter with The Daily Memphian. Um, I'll go to you first, Marjorie. You were two, we were just talking, you were on the show two years ago, right yes. after you had taken the job, I think that summer you had done it. Mm -hmm. what, what have you, I, I want to, all kinds of things about the landscape of higher ed, both locally and nationally, and where Rhodes fits in, where CBU fits in, and so on. But just in the two years you've been there, what are the biggest changes you've seen at Rhodes or been part of making at Rhodes in those two years? It's been a very busy two years. It's amazing how quickly it, yes, has, it has gone. I think uh, some of the things that I'm very proud that we've accomplished, we, I think, have begun to really think harder about the residential experience and what we want that to be uh, like for this generation of students. Our students are increasingly diverse. They are increasingly... Um, engaged and they are increasingly part of a generation in which living and learning together is is somewhat novel and so thinking about how we extend the classroom experience into the broader student experience has been a big piece of what we've done we've also been able to double the um, size of our Memphis Center through a generous gift from Lynn and Henry Turley. The Memphis Center, explain what that the is. The Memphis Center is our umbrella organization that uh, sort of guides and navigates our interactions with the city. So we've been excited to see the um, increasing impact and capacity that we have in areas such as public health, in areas such as education. Yeah. That's been very exciting. I want to come back to that Memphis Center sure. and that whole notion of the students out into the community. But yes. I'll bring Jack in. You, uh, you are two months? Two in months into the job. Yes. <laughs> so what have you gotten done? Uh, <laughs> well, first thing is I was fortunate to follow John Smiroli. Uh, Dr. Smiroli did a great job yeah. in putting uh, CBU not only on a firm financial footing, but also having us much more engaged in the Memphis community, which has been fantastic for us. So uh, moving forward, we are really focused on things such as community engagement, building upon his legacy. One of the areas that we've launched is the AutoZone Center for Community Engagement. This month of September is our September of Service, 30 Days of Good Deeds effort at, wow. at CBU. We've been doing that since 2012. And right now, throughout the community, we have over 600 volunteers who are working at various organizations, community development, educational, social services, and other areas throughout Memphis. And so like Marjorie, we view Memphis as part of our classroom experience, mm -hmm. and that's very important for our students. In, in terms of, John Smiley, Dr. Smiley was on the show a number of times over the years and was a big you know, figure in the community mm -hmm. and all kinds of things related to CBU always, but, but just in some ways sort of beyond. For you to coming in and, and the Board of Trustees and the Search Committee and all that, what, what did they just say, hey, stay the course, or did they want to say th this great foundation, we now want to do X, Y, and Z more or beyond what, what we've done so in the last I, 10 years? Yeah, I think number one was to build upon what John had already done, and that's very important. That sense of continuity, as Marjorie knows, is very important mm -hmm. with universities. Uh, you just don't take and go off on your own direction. At the same time, we're committed to growth. Uh, we are about 2,000 students currently. We're on a trajectory now to be at least 3,000 students. That's important for our sustainability. It's important for our students to have that type of environment. But it's also important for Memphis that we grow and we continue to engage and offer new programs. But 3,000 over what timeline? So we're looking at that over a five to seven year timeline. So we, for example, have a brand new nursing program, which we envision is growing. We have an absolutely fantastic school of engineering that has about 400 students. That can be somewhere between 600 and 700 students. Computer science is an area we're very strong under Dr. Pascal Perbrogen and Dr. Kathy Grillo. We envision doubling the size of that program and at the same time offering other new opportunities in graduate and maybe even doctoral programs. And we'll dig into some more of that. Let me get uh, Bill Dries involved. 
A couple of shows ago, uh, David Rudd from the University of Memphis was here, mm -hmm. and he talked about um, uh, preparing for or, or adjusting for a drop in the number of high school graduates in the Southeast United States. Is that as much of a factor for, for, for your campuses as it is for the University of Memphis? It certainly is for Rhodes. The demographic uh, picture is um, very very substantive and very important, I think, for every institution of higher education. At Rhodes, uh, we are preparing for that by making sure that we are recruiting nationally. There are pockets of the country where we see increases in students uh, coming up as, as well as decreases. We also are making sure that we're really prepared for a much more economically and culturally diverse student body so that we can be a destination of choice for bright, talented students from a variety of parts of the country and a variety of backgrounds. About 12% of our students currently are international students, and we anticipate that that may grow as well. Mm -hmm. Jack, what, what, what's your outlook on this so uh, I, at I CBU? Think we're all facing these national headwinds, right, that are very, very challenging for us. But at the same time, for us, we've always attracted our students from the Memphis area. So we have an opportunity, as Marjorie indicated, to look at a more national footprint. Mm -hmm. So later on in November, I'm going to be up the East Coast. We're going to be working that Northeast Corridor. We have a number of LaSallean Christian Brothers schools in that area. Uh, I want them to know about Memphis. Mm -hmm. I think they'll send their students there. I'll be back in Chicago, St. Louis, Little Rock uh, for the same reason. And then at the suggestion of Marjorie, we're going to be in places like Dallas because mm -hmm. we have a strong science and engineering program. We think that's very attractive to students there, uh, particularly from faith-based schools to send their students to Memphis, being a very strong environment academically, but also with the supports that we need to have that they'll be here and that'll be a growth for mm -hmm. us over time. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, without growing and without maintaining that focus, um, we have challenges, but I think we both have unique positions mm -hmm. where we're, we're gonna be able to overcome that. I agree, and you, know, you and I have already talked together about the importance of working together yes. to talk about Memphis as an, a wonderful college town. It's a really unique destination for college age students and it gives both of us I think a strategic advantage as we think about recruiting students in an ever more competitive landscape. Mm -hmm. And working uh, not only together but with other higher education mm -hmm. institutions in town to really build on some of the initiatives um, choose you know 901 and the uh, bring your soul campaign mm -hmm. um, to really expand that to make it clear to people beyond the borders of our city and our state why Memphis is a wonderful place to come for college and then as you and I have talked about to stay to build your career and family which for both of us many of our graduates do right and and, and college town it is is kind of a different place for Memphis because so so much of the college experience here has been defined by this idea that 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 we're we're a commuter type mm -hmm. type mm -hmm. e experience here. The the other point is that we hear so much talk civically about talent retention, and and from your comments, I mean, this is where it really starts. It is, it is. and you may have heard me say that I think Rhodes and no doubt CBU as well mm -hmm. are uh, brain faucets for Memphis as opposed to brain drains. 10% uh, approximately of our students come from this region and 40% of our graduates stay here after they graduate. So we're bringing talent, we're holding them here. They stay because of the incredible career opportunities and they stay because of the incredible cultural and civic opportunities. So one of um, my goals is to make sure that we're continuing to build bridges between the campus and the community so that we can retain even more of our students here. How much is, and we actually, I think when we originally thought of the show, we were gonna try to get uh, Dr. Rudd from mm -hmm. the University of Memphis on as well, and we couldn't do it scheduling wise, which is fine, but we had him on a couple weeks ago, which is online and, and on the podcast, I think. But how much, I mean, they've had a lot of change. I mean, over the last few years, I mean, his goal, I mean, the, the goal of the U of M for decades was to get its own Board of Regents, and he right. talked about how important that's been and all this expansion, and they opened up their geographic region of, of who could get in-state mm -hmm. tuition, and they've upped their, their scores. Is that a, does that make them more a, a competitor to you all, or does, is it a rising tide situation? I, I think it's definitely a rising tide, you know, from, uh, I used to work at a university much like Memphis at Montclair State in New Jersey, 
And the more that we did, it benefit our, our neighboring mm -hmm. institutions, whether or not they were other public institutions or local privates as well. The reality is, is that the better we all do collectively, that it's going to be better for Memphis and, and our future here as a community. And he has offerings that are fantastic, David does at Memphis, mm -hmm. but we have our unique strengths here as well, and we can continue to collaborate, as we already are doing, between Rhodes and CBU in a way that builds upon those strengths and allows us to leverage each other. So for example, exactly. we've recently launched a Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Marjorie and I are already pulling our two campuses together to leverage that for the benefit of not just students mm -hmm. on our campus, but also at Rhodes, and most importantly, for the local entrepreneurs that are here, either on our campuses or already in Midtown and other areas that would benefit from that type of collaboration. The, um, it's interesting, Bill talked about you know, the, the notion of commuter schools, and so when I moved to Memphis 25 years ago, there was a sense that U of M was a commuter school, that, that Christian Brothers was more of a commuter school. Rhodes was not, but it was an island, mm -hmm. you know, both figuratively and literally, the walls right. and the gates, and it, you sort of went in there and you stayed in there and then you came out and you may or may not have stayed in Memphis. That, that shifted under your predecessor, and it sounds like with this Memphis Center, y'all yes. are doing more and more to, to, to leverage Memphis, not, not stay away from Memphis. No, you're exactly right. And it's, a, it's an important uh, project for us because we do find that our students crave a sense of belonging and community on campus as well. It's a very important uh, experience, we think, for students to be in a kind of civic laboratory on campus where they learn how to work out problems together, they learn the skills for democratic citizenship in terms of living with um, in a diverse community, they uh, are able to see the impact of their classroom experience in their communal life together and then to take those skills out into the community and sort of in concentric circles uh, expand outward. So we, we don't see the on-campus experience and the community experience as in tension. We see those as in collaboration and as in connection. And we're working hard to articulate that uh, in ever stronger ways. Yeah, Memphis is one of those places too. I mean, I, I hear it all the time, at, not just with college kids, but people my age or people, professionals, where if, you, if you're willing to try to make a difference or have some impact, you can. You, you, the, the organizations will let you in, whether it's a nonprofit organization, it's a cultural organization, yes. they will let you in. So you find that with the students as well. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, we also know that we want to help our students enter into that space in a spirit of humility, in a spirit of learning, in a spirit of respect and appreciation for what the city offers them. So for us with the Center for Community Engagement, building upon that point, it's been really fantastic. We're focused now on Binghampton as well as Orange Mound, which are local communities for us. But we're going in with the spirit that we don't have all of the mm -hmm. answers. Matter of fact, we may have none of the answers, but we need to work together to address the challenges that we have to work together. So our students are going to be involved with those community leaders and working on solutions that will be sustainable over time, that will provide that type of learning experience mm -hmm. where it's important for our students to have and at the same time build long-term bridges between CBU and those very important historic communities. Bill. Uh, Jack, J John Smarelli, uh, who is still working in the community this here, is, we should uh, point out where yeah, he, right. we've been talking He's about him in, in yes. the past yes. decade. Yes. <laughs> He's very active on yeah. other fronts. But, but uh, he, he was especially active in, in uh, immigration issues on, on the CBU campus. Uh, and there was, and admitted there, there was a lot of discussion going both ways about whether the university should be involved in that. Uh, what, what, what is the future of, of those programs and those efforts that, that, that he undertook? Uh, John did that because that type of initiative is very much part of our LaSalle identity. Uh, since we were founded, the Christian Brothers, as an order over 300 years ago, they have always reached out to those who may not have the most in terms of uh, resources or may not have the most fortunate of circumstances. So John's commitment to the Dreamers and DACA eligible students is something that we are going to continue with. Uh, we recently had Don Graham, the former publisher of the Washington Post, the chairman of the Dream US organization. They have recommitted to supporting us. Uh, you'll be hearing news shortly that another anonymous donor is going to continue to not only support but increase the support for those students 
And for us, uh, to Marjorie's point earlier, that diversity, that richness mm -hmm. is very important to us. Those students are graduating at a higher rate than the rest of our students. Uh, they are doing academically just as well, and in many cases even better than our, our uh, general students are. And most importantly, they are very appreciative of the opportunity that's being afforded them. So we're excited about that. We're also learning a lot of things from them that we're gonna be able to apply to across our university to improve our retention and graduation mm -hmm. rates, which I think is very, very important for all of us because at CBU, I've talked about this, when we admit a student, we, I believe, have a moral obligation to ensure that she or he graduates within four years. If we don't do that, uh, we're putting those students into a very, very difficult financial situation. And quite honestly, we're taking what's the American dream of a college degree and turning it into a dead end that can quickly become a nightmare if you haven't achieved that uh, goal within that period of time. It's. Rhodes too has been involved uh, na both nationally um, and uh, regionally on these issues and we have signed on to some amicus briefs in support of pathways to citizenship and education for uh, undocumented students and DACA students. Um, you know what you were talking about that commitment to graduation, that commitment to seeing a pathway for our students to success and flourishing in the future. That's really part of the mission of private higher education in the state of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, across the state, private institutions enroll just over 25% of all of the students, but we graduate and are responsible for more than 33% of the state's degrees. So the completion mm -hmm. and the sense that we, we see admission as a commitment to the student for the yes for the future. I think that mm -hmm. our, our mission-centered institutions share that. Right. Uh, Marjorie, these days my life is all about politics. So, so, so <laughs> let me, let me ask you. <laughs> yes. yes. Let, me, let, let me ask you about, about uh, the two very vibrant and active campus Democrats and campus Republicans yes. organizations you, you, you have on, on campus there at, at Rhodes College. And what, what, what is the environment like on your campus as we head into the national elections mm -hmm. next year? Because these two groups uh, have really made an effort to communicate with each other and kind of set a, 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 a new kind of atmosphere mm -hmm. for this. You wrote, a, in fact, wrote a lovely article uh, talking with both of those groups, I think about a year ago. Mm -hmm. and. This is an example of what I was talking about, about the importance of a campus community where students can learn skills that are harder to learn at this point in our nation's history from the broader world. And because they, we are a relationship-driven campus and because our students come to know each other beyond just those political ideologies and labels, we really have a, an opportunity for a, a kind of richer dialogue than we're seeing nationally now and our students have have risen to that they both are very strong in their own you know beliefs and we have multiple student organizations beyond just college democrats and, and republicans but um, our college republicans recently were honored as sort of a wonderful organization by the state and our college democrats have been very active at a number of levels and very successful but those groups are able to carry on a kind of dialogue i'll give you just a quick example they, our students held a debate last year. They canvassed all of the student body and asked for issues-driven questions. Mm -hmm. Students from each group uh, researched the answers from their party platforms. They got up and uh, gave those positions and took, responded to questions from the audience. The place was packed. It was extremely civil. It was issue-oriented, and it was uh, extremely moving. If the rest of the community and the world could learn from the way our students are engaging in dialogue around very difficult issues, I think we would be a better place. Mm -hmm. the, the Memphis Center uh, has, has done so much work in, in better defining Memphis culture a, a, as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the, one of the programs that, that I was most interested in is, is uh, digitizing the papers of Robertson Top. Yeah. Who who incorporated South Memphis and started the Gayoso ho Hotel here? You've also got one of the best collections, one one of the two definitive collections 
of Richard Halliburton's journals and 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 diaries yes. a, a, as well. So so what are some of the goals in, in terms of the Memphis Center moving forward with, with those kind of pursuits? It's very important for us to use our center as a place where all of Memphis can be seen and understood. And we the the projects that get taken up are driven both by faculty and student passion and interests, and they range everything from culture and history and music to uh, race and politics and uh, some of the more challenging aspects of what our city has to grapple with to, um, to, to the, some of the kinds of historical pieces that you're talking about. And we really want the needs of the city and the needs of our students to come together there and for uh, our center to be a place where learning happens, not just for our students, mm -hmm. but for everyone in Memphis who's interested in, um, in learning and celebrating and in using that knowledge to, to make a better Memphis. Um, we talk about these issues, the kind of nationalist. I'm going to stay with you for a second, Marjorie. On sure. you, you recently, you all recently renamed a building. Yeah. Um, talk on the outside. It was, and I've forgotten the name. Uh, 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 we moved from a building that was named uh, Palmer Hall to now the building's name is Southwestern Hall. And, and why was that? That was a really interesting uh, project and an interesting set of questions. So the namesake of the building had been uh, Benjamin Palmer, a very well-known Southern theologian, not largely active in Memphis, but uh, but important to many Presbyterians throughout the South. But his legacy had been uh, to offer a very impassioned and difficult uh, just biblical, so-called biblical justification, first for slavery and then later in his life for Jim Crow. And as our community began to wrestle with that legacy, we, we recognized we needed to go through a, a process to think about how we wanted that to be remembered how we wanted to commemorate that and grapple with that in the present. So it was a very inclusive process. We had opportunities for learning about his history over a two year period that included our students, our faculty, our community, our extended mm -hmm. alumni body. We knew from the beginning that there would not be a unanimity, but we were very concerned that the process be a model of the liberal arts and a model of liberal lear learning and how we, how we wrestle with, with difficult questions. Um, we ultimately, as, as you mentioned, did rename the building. We have also have a class this year that is working on creating a plaque to put in the building that will give a more realistic and historically accurate picture of who uh, Benjamin Palmer was and, and his legacy. And we also are in the process of establishing a Rhodes History Day so that annually we have an opportunity to think about aspects of our own institutional history and learn from that. Um, Jack, a quick question. This is a much bigger question, but is you look, where is CBU? There's there's this kind of tuition inflation and this concern about where college tuition, private college tuition, right. is going. We talked about that with Dr. Rudd last week, and that in some ways they are really well positioned as it, tuition at schools like you were talking about the Northeast, NYU, mm -hmm. where my right. daughter goes. Mm -hmm. It's an exorbitant. I mean, it's just an insane amount of money that some of these places are charging. Where does CBU sit in that landscape, and, and does it concern you this this rate of inflation and cost inflation that's happening? So, as someone who's still paying off student loans for my daughter, <laughs> uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that if you take a look at what the cost of uh, education for me when I went to LaSalle University in Philadelphia, another Christian Brothers school. Uh, back in the early 1980s, it was $3,000. Now that is in the $40,000 range. And there should not be that type of inflation looking at everything else in terms of the cost of living. At the same time, we face a challenge. We need to provide more supports for our students. We need to comply with a host of governmental mandates at both the federal and the state level. And then last but not least, we have to pay our, our, our faculty, our staff, and administrators wages that are competitive. They come for the mission, so they're not looking for the same levels mm -hmm. as in private industry, but they do need to be able to sustain their families and, and also pay in many cases for their own children's education. We're gonna be taking a look at that this year as to what is the right pricing for CBU. We're looking at it in terms of what is the value proposition. And as I talked earlier and the point that you made, we are very price competitive relative to the Northeast and other parts mm -hmm. of the country, and I think that will offer us an advantage along with the fact that we're here in Memphis to attracting students from those areas.
with just a minute, with just a minute left, sure. actually, I want to shift gears a little bit. We talked about this before, and you, rec you, you, I read recently. I'm not sure when it went up. The essay you wrote about your fight, your struggle, your conquering of of breast cancer. Talk, talk about it a little bit, and we'll find some time to talk more sure. another time. Thank you for bringing that. But I do want to just for, factually for your point, um, Tennessee's private higher education is on average 26 percent less than comparable schools throughout the country. Mm -hmm. So we all are yeah, doing yeah. our best. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I appreciate your bringing that up. Uh, it was very challenging to begin my presidency here in. Uh, Memphis in the midst of treatment for breast cancer. I'm very happy to be sitting here cancer free and, and healthy and grateful for that experience. Um, but I, I really have written and spoken publicly about it because I want women and others affected by cancer to feel confident in sharing their stories. Uh, it's very healing to be able to find your own meaning in an experience like that. And I was grateful that my community has received that. And as you noted, I just published an article recently on Medium about my experience. And what we talked about is we've started an, an extra podcast on the Daily yeah. Monthly and getting in as, as we go into Breast Cancer Month yes. and, and the real complications in trouble. It's an amazing, yes. people can look at Medium. It's Marjorie Haas. If yes. they just search, they'll find it. Yes. Thank you for sharing. And sure. we'll talk more about that on I'll the I'll look forward podcast. to that. Thank you. Uh, it is election season. We've done a bunch of shows that are online with mayoral candidates, the sales tax referendum. You can get the podcast or you can look at the past shows. Uh, we will be back next week to talk about the election results. Thank you for joining us. Have a good week.